Hello, hello. Welcome. I'm Rick Roman here at EEAP, sitting alongside of Michael Crawley. Today we're going to be talking about reporting injuries and illness to Cal OSHA. Before we get started, though, for any of you that have not attended an EEAP webinar, if you notice at the top of the sidebar on your right, there are four tabs. Uh, they are labeled chat, polls, attendees, and pop-ins. If we take a poll or add a pop-in during the webinar, it'll appear automatically. And if you have questions afterwards, all you have to do is click on the chat tab, and you'll be taken back where you can type in your questions. Uh, so that takes care of that. So without further delay, we'll go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, Michael. Good afternoon. I hope everybody is doing okay. We're going to be talking about a conversation that always is uncomfortable by all the businesses out there on when to report, when not to report, and what they've got going on. So let me just start out with the overview here real quick. Uh, the differences between a recordable and a reportable incident is going to be one of the topics we cover. We're also going to talk about what defines a serious physical harm, the timeline for reporting, where and what to report, and the penalty for failing to report. Those are going to be the characteristics that we, uh, we're going to be going through. Let's start out with recordable versus reportable. Three levels of injury and illnesses. First one is going to be it only requires first aid and can be treated in-house. This is going to be like a doctor's, uh, like a first aid or something like that, a cut, a scrape that we can deal with a bandage or something like that. That's what that's going to be. The second one is going to be requires medical treatment and or time off of work or job reassignment. That's going to be a recordable. Now, when I say a recordable, I'm specifically saying to a CalHOSHA 300 log, I'm saying also to uh, a, a workers' comp agency, and you can get more def definitions from your workers' comp agents on what is a recordable, but just for this webinar, we're trying to separate the differences between what a CalOSHA recordable is and a workers' comp recordable, because there is two different things that you're going to find out. All right, the third one is going to be results in death or meets serious physical harm criteria, which is requires Kaloshi to be notified. So the third one is the only category that is going to make it so you have to notify Kaloshi. Now that third one that we're talking about, this right now what you're looking at is going to be the definition of it. And uh, what we've done is we've put a picture there that obviously is probably getting your attention a little bit, and that's going to play into a little bit of what we're talking about and how loose and somewhat vague this law is. So let me just read it word for word, and we'll go down through it. And uh, if you have any questions regarding this, feel free to type in questions even before the end of the webinar, and we will either address them now or when we get to the end. So let me start out here. Any inpatient hospitalization for the purpose other than observation uh, is required. So if they're in the hospital for uh, just because they're trying to uh, do observation and watch them for the next few weeks, that doesn't require CalOSHA. But if they're in there overnight because they need surgery or something like that, that's what's going to trigger it on that. All right, the next bullet point. The loss of any member of the body. This is called the amputation rule that most of the district managers will talk about. This amputation is going to be uh, a finger, a knuckle, but it can be right down to the basics of this. It can be down to the basics of an ear with a tip with a little bit of cartilage. And so you've got to know that on that first doctor's report, if the doctor suggests that there is a partial amputation, then you've you got to make sure that you've got, uh, you've got that in place. The next bullet point is any serious degree of permanent disfigurement. Now this one, i got to tell you, is very vague. Um, I, uh, I always say that if you're looking at the employees uh, when they're injured or, or you're looking at the cuts and it leaves major, major scars or disfigurement of the bones or the fingers, this one is going to be vague, but uh, if you're looking at it and you're thinking, wow, that is really a nasty injury, it's probably going to be permanently disfigured. I know that's a crappy standard, but that is uh, probably a good way to be able to figure that out, and you can call us and go over that. The last one here is going to be quite long, and uh, I, I need you to hear the insanity of it to a certain degree and the vagueness of it. 
impairment sufficient to cause a part of the body or the function of an organ to become permanently and significantly reduced in efficiency on or off the job, but not limited to, depending on the severity, second degree burn, second degree or worse burns, crushing injuries, including internal injuries, even though even though the skin surface may be intact, respiratory illnesses or broken bones. Now, a lot of you like me are looking at this and thinking, second degree burns. You got to be kidding me. And so the reality of it is you, you really got to make sure that when you have an accident, that you have a method of determining quickly if this is going to be a Cal OSHA. And I can't say this uh, enough, that once the employee in, an, in, the, in the event of an injury gets hurt, the, the best thing you can do for them is to, once the employee is stable, of course, and the ambulance has been called or they're doing okay, you give us a call and allow us just to walk you through what the next steps are. We, we will be able to ask you a number of questions that can help you figure out what steps you are. So if you're clients of mine, which the majority of you are, you just call us on our 1-800 number. It's at the bottom of every safety lesson we give you, the labor law posters you purchase from us, at the documentation we have, you can go on to eeap.com and our 800 number's there. I have my 24-hour consultation line, and after hours that does reach me, you leave a message, it beeps me and tells me there's a message, and I will call you back. But it's important that we have this conversation. Uh, because of some of the other information we're going to give you that we'll go over in a minute. All right. What is the timeline for reporting? That is going to be the, the, the best thing to be able to talk about when it comes to understanding how fast we have to re react. Every employer shall report immediately by telephone or telegraph, I, I can't imagine you got one of those, but in the case you do, to the nearest district office of the Division of Occupational Safety and Health any serious injury or illness or death of an employee occurring in the place of employment or in connection with any employment. Now these bullet points that Rick has put together for us, these most of these are all Cal OSHA code right out of the code so you can see it. And so I find it important to read it to you so you can hear how they, they read it so you know that this isn't just Michael and Rick making up our own rules to this. This one always throws our clients into a little bit of a concern, how fast, what not. Immediately means as soon as particularly possible, but no longer than eight hours. After the employer knows, and here's the catch, or with diligent inquiry would have known of the death or serious injury illness. So if you're saying to yourself, well, I didn't know, I truly didn't know the accident took place, and so I, I didn't need to call. It happened on a Friday afternoon. We had all gone home for the day, but I left a small crew at the job site or in the shop, and somebody got injured, and I didn't find out until about Monday. The, the reality is diligent inquiry means you, you, you would have been able to keep an eye on your employees. So if your employees are working, there always should be a chain of command to be able to communicate with you quickly about serious accidents or events that are taking place. And if you are out of the country or in a spot where you can't get cell phone coverage, where that communication can't be there, you must set up a second level, a second level to be able to respond to these things because I only have eight hours and then we're going to get a fine that's going to be large and it's going to be difficult for me to defend. And so the reality is to your management, you need to set up this and this is why the 24-hour consultation is there, that your management can call me and say, Michael, Cindy, those are going to be the two main people you'll talk to here, or even Lori McFate in my office. And you're going to say, ladies, Michael, what, what, what should I do? This is what's happened. I can't get a hold of this person. Help me walk me through the steps. And I can give them advice on what to do to help them move through that. And so that's going to be something that we offer you and you need to be able to keep aware of. I'm going to turn this over to Rick for a minute, just kind of explain this slide if that's okay. So here you go, Rick. Okay. So when it comes to where to report, you'll see on the right here we have a list with all the district offices in California and we're going to be providing a download of that for you as well. Um, and as Michael mentioned previously, you must report to the nearest district office. If you look at the bottom there, um, you'll notice that there's a link that goes to Cal OSHA's site. It'll be hyperlinked off of the download that we'll be giving you. And if you click on that link, it'll take you to Cal OSHA's site. And on the top left-hand side of their site, 
uh, you can click on that link and it's a district office locator. All you have to do is uh, click, type in either your zip code or the name of your city and uh, the district office that you need to report to will appear at that time. Um, so I would recommend that you print this and either circle or highlight the office that you would need to report to and make sure that the appropriate personnel have access to that. So whatever that means, posting it somewhere, making copies, whatever it takes. Um, so you'll notice also in this download uh, that there's some information there that will tell you about things that you need to report and uh, that's some information that Michael's going to go over with you here as well. Uh, Rick is always really good at putting this stuff together and making sure the downloads are there for you so that you can you, you, you can have what you need. If you do need anything else from us, don't hesitate to call us and ask us. We are, we are here to be able to deliver the safety, is the safety uh, support that you need to make sure you can do your job. All right, what to report when they call. And this is a good thing to go over so that you just can get in your, in your mind, in the back of your mind, what you should be aware of at the time uh, that you actually takes place. Time and date, of course. Name, the employer's name. You want to be able to deliver that. Who the heck you're working for, of course. The name and job title of the person reporting. you got to be able to be prepared to ha know your title. So make sure that people who are assigned to this task, they know who they are. They know what really their title is. The I address of the site or the accident. That seems... Uh, Probably normal for those who are not uh, that are in, in a one location company like a factory or something. But the reality is, on a construction site, you, you want to be able to do something more than just saying, "Yeah, I'm somewhere northeast of Balboa Road," and uh, it, you need to know some specifics as much as possible. And I do understand that is that is difficult. Uh, the name of the person to contact at the site, the name and address of the injured employee, if you know. Uh, nature of the injury, location where the injury employees were and what moved, a list of all the law enforcement agencies at the present, what you had to call, the cops, the fire department, that kind of stuff, and a description of the accident. Now let me focus on the description of the accident real quick as we're getting to the next slide. The, the description of the accident is going to be vague, and I'll tell you why. It's not that you're trying to mislead or do anything, but you just don't have a lot of information there. And so when you're in that reporting mode, it's important for you not to guess. It's, it's important for you not to say, I think. It's important for you to say, I know this and this happened. If questions are proposed to you that you truly don't know, then your answer very simply is, you know, that's a good question. I need to get back to you on that. I need to find out that answer. What I, what I really don't like is when I come into an OSHA case and, and the employer's reported and the, and the person who reported the action to begin with very frantic, which is understandable, but they start saying all sorts of things, like, I think this is what happened, or I think this is what happened, which stirs up a hornet's nest in all certain areas that may be or may not be true. And so we want to always, always tell the truth. But we don't want to guess either. We want to make sure we, we lead Cal OSHA down the true and honest path and not mislead them. So if you don't know or you're not sure, the word is, that is a great question. I don't, I'm not sure about that. Let me get back to you. That needs to be in your vocabulary. If you need to say it in a mirror 500 times to get it there, please, please do so. All right, this slide, how horrible it looks to look at. I got to talk to Rick about making these gr dramatic pictures in there. But nonetheless, the code that we're talking about for reporting, if you do want to look it up, is called the 342A. Calis she calls it the 342A violation. And right now, it is a mandatory $5,000 penalty. This penalty is put on if you go over the eight hours. And when you go over the eight hours and you don't report, you, you've got to really be able to have some extensive circumstances that made it so that you didn't know about it. Because I was out of the office or I was out of town, that, that won't cut it on a Cal OSHA front. The citation is coming like, like, a, like a bulldozer and I won't be able to stop it because you, you, the reality is if you're out of town, you should have a system in place, even if you have five employees. If you have employees working, you should be able to develop some sort of lower-end management team or some sort of managing team that's prepared for some sort of accident. It's part of the training process. Uh, agency's report is not on uh, agency's report is not on your behalf. You must also report. So if you have a fire department or a police department that get to the location 
and you find yourself saying them saying, well, we're going to call Cal OSHA, you got to know that that's not good enough. The code is for you to report. It is not for the fire department. Of course, they need to report too, but the reality is somebody usually reports. It's either the doctor's office, the fire department, the police department, or an employee sitting around the room that thought you should have. And so the reality is it's always better to do the right thing. So just know that. Um, when you do report uh, after hours, let me just go over this real quick, you, you, you'll find that if it's after 5 o'clock on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, basically any, any day, after 5 o'clock they have an answering service that will answer the phone. And so you shouldn't feel like it's after 5, I can't report. No, that's not, that's not okay. You should be calling the answering service and call off a phone that you can go back and see that you've called. Something like a cell phone where you can check the cell phone records or whatnot. Sometimes you call from the office and uh, the phone bills are so large you couldn't track it down to save your soul. So you want to call off something you can track and you want to write down the name of the person you spoke to and what time you did. So if somebody had an action about 3 o'clock and they give me a call on the phone and we're not sure of a lot of facts, there are times where I tell the contact, you're going to call me back in two hours. Figure out this, this, and this, and you're going to call me back in two hours. And we can go all night like that until we really have a good understanding about it. And so before I can really say, all right, here's my opinion, you should do this or this. And then you get to make that fine business choice. But the reality is you need to be prepared after an accident to be able to go through that and uh, be able to take care of that. On this slide, let me address one more thing, if I may, about let's say I, I have an accident. Is it better to report late or is it better to go the chance and hope I don't get caught? That is a question that is uh, saved for the guy who pays payroll at a company. Let me just share with you my experience. It is better to out yourself rather than to get caught. As a small child, if my mother and dad, I got away with something for a time and they caught me, they were both mad at me because I did something stupid, of course, but in, in addition, I became a liar and it made my life very difficult. These lessons I've learned through my life and I hope to teach my children or continue to teach my children these principles. But in business, I promise you they work the same. If you have a problem and you are late, your system does not react the way you think it should have, and you are late and you're now facing a $5,000 penalty, it is better to be late than to be caught. There are some things I can do to minimize the penalties if I can prove that you were trying to do the right things and you were late. So if late is the goal, there are things that I can do. But I have seen employers a year down the line, something happens, Cal OSHA comes in, they ask for all of their workers' comp uh, claims in the last some odd years, and they find out that you did not report an accident. And I'm telling you, they now deem us to be a certain classification in their minds, and they railroad us. And it's very difficult because they can't trust us, and we look like one of those, we, we don't look positive, let's just say. So don't forget 5,000 if you don't report it. If you have questions, give us a call on that, on that topic. Will reporting lead to an inspection? There's a dang good chance. Let's be honest. There's a darn good chance that they're going to lead to an inspection. But if you're outing yourself, the hope is that these Cal OSHA agents will be better to us more understandable that we're trying to do the right things. This on your left is a document request sheet. This is very typical of what Cal OSHA comes for. We've talked about this in other meetings, what to do if Cal OSHA comes to your, your location. And what you do is this. You ask for the sheet politely. If they ask you for documentation of any kind, the training, training inspections, employee interviews, or whatnot, anything that needs to be in writing, your answer is, I would love to get that to you. If you can give me a document request sheet, I would be glad to do that for you. And that's what will come. All right. When they come out, they're going to do a targeted inspection for the most part, unless they feel like you're, and I'm going to use the word a savage, like you, you really are running a sweatshop and you really don't care. In that kind of a spec, in that kind of a situation, they can open the inspection up to be broader. Employee interviews, they have the right to do, and you don't have the right to stop them from interviewing the employees. They, employee supervisors do have the right to have counsel, but employees, the employer cannot stop Cal OSHA from interviewing employees. 
All right, uh, safety, uh, written safety programs are going to ask for. You're just going to ask for that documentation, and I take care of all those for you, so you'll be good. Safety training records. Uh, we're doing safety training records. If you're applying, if, you, if you're doing, letting us come out and do monthly training, you'll find that our new tr system is we save your safety sign-off sheets online now so that you'll be able to see those if we're doing the monthly training. Uh, injured employees information and training on them that will make it online easy for you to locate that but you need to be have a system in place so that you can go back and find those training records all right inspection records you'll need to have online which is on your client center website that we have built for you and uh, if you need more information about that you can give us a call in the office and any proof of workers compensation insurance and they may just ask you for a list of uh, the um, the claims that you've had over the last three years. So let me just say this real quick. If you have a need or you want to hear more about what we do for those that are not clients, give us a call. I do a free safety evaluation anywhere in the state of California and you're more than welcome to give us a call on that. Uh, when it comes to the question and answer period, here we are. I'm trying to hit you with this information so I don't take too much of your time. Uh, and we do have some questions that we're going to be asking here. Rick, why don't you start out reading us some of the questions, Rick? Okay, well, to start here, uh, someone's asking if there's a maximum fine on the citation for a 342A. Yeah, well, we've answered that already, but let me just kind of just hit that topic a bit. It is 5000 That's the maximum fine. It used to be higher, but you'll find that we can do a little bit of a reduction nowadays, and let me tell you, that changes regularly if we can show that we're late to a certain degree. So if you do have a penalty that's taken place or you had an accident that took place that you are late on, give us a call. It's going to be better that you just report yourself and be late, and that way I can get a little bit of a reduction. Okay. Um, now one of the questions that I get asked often from uh, from uh, companies is what if Cal OSHA actually shows up on the scene of the accident? Do they still need to report in that case? Uh, that is a crafty question, Rick. I think that is actually very good. That happens to you more often than not. I think the fire department will call Cal OSHA on the way to an accident if they already know some of the stand, uh, some of the ex some of the things that are there already. Remember, the code is you must call and report to Cal OSHA by telephone or telegraph. So if they come to your job site and you're there with them and you're talking to them and they do an inspection, my first question is, have you called them by telephone yet? If the answer is no, then you must call them by telephone to report the accident. I know it sounds crazy because you're saying, well, they're already there on site. But I'm telling you, I have done this debate before and it, and it is, it is not, it's the letter of the law that needs to take place, not the spirit of the law in this case. Okay. Um, we do get people asking also, uh, which you did touch on a little bit, is uh, when other agencies do show up, like the fire department, and, and we did go over that as far as uh, making sure that you report on your own behalf, because not only, not only do, does the fire department or the police department, uh, but also the hospitals, uh, the people that will treat the patients are also required to report, so it's important that, that you report on your own behalf uh, on that. Um, not seeing any other questions at this point. Um, let me let me close it up here, Rick, by just saying s some things about what we've got going on with this. And, and as I'm closing up, if you do have any other questions, feel feel free to type them in. Um, th this is difficult. A lot of us don't want Calosha to come to our facilities and do and do and do a site and, and do an inspection. You'll find that uh, the citation given side. Uh, they don't give a whole lot of warnings, but with that being said, they're, they are not monsters. They, they can be worked with, and a lot of these district managers, they are good people just trying to do their job. And what you'll find is if a company is open and honest and forthright, I find that there's a lot of movement that can be made with them. There's a, there's a lot of reasoning with them that we can do. So if you find yourself having an accident or you have questions, you should call us. I even find my clients a lot of the times, they get in the rigmarole of doing great and expanding their business, that something happens and they just forget to call me and say, I've had this problem, what do you think? That does not cost you anything when you're doing business with me. I would love to have that conversation, that chat with you at any time. So if you do get caught in a spot where you are questioning what it is, 
My staff in the office open 8 to 5 every day. Uh, would love to be able to answer any question you have or go over that for you. Rick, any other things before we take any more of these wonderful people's time? Yes. Um, let's see here. Go into a little bit of what hospitalization for other than observation means. Uh, that, that is meaning that if they go into a hospital for, let's say, they fall and they, and they, and they, get, uh, they hit the ground and you're really worried about them, you think they need to go to the hospital and you call 911, they take them to the hospital and they're in the hospital. They do some x-rays, the, the, the person has no broken bones, there's nothing going on, but the employee is saying, I'm just not feeling a bit right. And sometimes a hospital might keep them overnight for observation to see how it goes. In that kind of an extent, we would not call Cal OSHA, but you would need to be clear that it was for observation. You, you couldn't make the argument later, well, I thought it was in the beginning, but no. And so if the action took place at noon, we probably would be talking all through the night. You, you would probably be calling me at 3 and 4 and, 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 and then again at 7 or 8 saying, do you know any more information? What do you know? And it might be that you need to call at 10 o'clock at night because you find out. But observation is literally they're just watching you to make sure you're okay. Okay, next question. If we're not sure if an accident needs to be reported, is it better to report and ask or just use your best judgment? Well, I, I like the thought that you're going to call us and we'll have that conversation, but, but let me just say, truthfully, you, if there's nothing wrong with calling Cal OSHA. Calling them anonymously and just saying to them outright, listen, uh, you know, I, I just want to figure out if this is a reportable accident and, and just kind of get a sense. I don't really want to tell you my name just yet. These people will answer your question and then decide if it is. So if you want to call anonymously and broadly ask, that's okay, but know that after hours, you're not going to get that. The answering service is not going to be able to answer any of your questions. And depending on what district office, how well they're staffed, you might get somebody that can answer the question, and they can't. So your best bet is to call us. Okay, next question. And if, if an interview is being done by Cal OSHA, and the person being interviewed, is the, Eng the interview is in English, but that is their second language, who interprets for them? Well, a lot of the Cal OSHA inspectors will be, will do speak Spanish, but in the event that they come across an employee that doesn't speak Spanish, um, i, I got to be honest with you, that, that is something that you don't want to interpret for. I, I, the Cal OSHA has methods of bringing out other inspectors who do speak Spanish so that they can get the proper information. I, I would hate for your employees to translate for your other employees on an interview and then you know, somebody didn't understand the right dialect where they didn't translate it correctly. It just becomes a, a you know, excuse the term, a crapshoot. It, it just becomes a cluster, and that's not a really great option. So Cal OSHA has methods that if they need to speak to the injured employee, that they have their own translators. Okay, here, uh, we got a question. Someone is asking about the download. If, if you've gone to the chat uh, to ask questions and want to get back to the download at the top of the sidebar, uh, there's a tab labeled pop-ins and if you click the pop-in it'll bring the download back up for you and you can download download it and uh, you will receive uh, asking about uh, a copy of the presentation within a few hours you will get uh, an email for the replay on this um, next question is asking how do I know what office to report an accident to uh, we went over that part. In, if you download the PDF, it's got a list of all of the of, of the district offices, and uh, it also has a link to Cal OSHA's site where you can uh, put in your zip code or city, and it'll tell you which district office that you need to report to. Uh, you will also be able to ask them when you report, this is where the accident took place, is this the right office? And the, and the people on the phone should be able to tell you. If it's after hours, though, uh, at least get me the phone call in to somewhere in California. I had one person once say, well, I called, but I called the federal system in, in Chicago or, or, you know, in some other weird state. And it was like, are you kidding me? You didn't even get close, and they still cited them. So you got to get me at least close. So... Um, in addition to having the download here, you can also go to our website. So if you ever, if you print it now and need it in the future, you can go to our go to our website, and uh, we have a tab on there that you can go to 
that uh, for reporting accidents that we'll, we'll have that download. Now, uh, next question here says, are we allowed to turn an inspector away and have them come back with an official warrant? And uh, if so, are there any repercussions for doing so? Well, you're always you're always allowed to turn people away, but uh, you can imagine they won't be too friendly when you've made them go the extra avenue to get the warrant. Uh, I've been doing this a long time. EAP has been around over 25 years, and I'm telling you, you, you really don't want to do that to them. You, you really don't want to send Kalosh away and make their life harder. I promise you that, that in their internal offices, you will be well known, and when you call in, when you're trying to deal with them, it, it, it'll be well known from the district managers, the regional managers, and the and the, the, the low amount of judges they have. It's not like they got 500 judges, and so the reality is your, your name will be broadcasted everywhere, and that really isn't a good thing. You, you don't want to do that. Let them in. Let them do their thing, and we'll deal with Cal OSHA on the backside. We do the right things. Good things come. Okay. If an if an employee claims an injury a year after it occurred and now requires surgery, does this have to be recorded with Cal OSHA? Uh, the answer is yes. If there's an accident that takes place a long time down the road, but it didn't need anything until surgery a year later, that's when the eight hours kicks in, eight hours from your knowing. So if he walks in and says, hey, i got to have surgery next week, you just had a reportable Cal OSHA, a reportable Cal OSHA accident, and uh, we would need to call it in right then, and it would be, and we would be able to work that out. That wouldn't be a problem. Okay. Um... Someone's asking here, they said they know they can call, they want to know if we have an email, if you have questions. Yeah, you can always email us at info at eeap.com, uh, or I'm sorry, dot net, um, and, and we can answer questions. Also on the replay, uh, you can also, we'll have the ability to ask questions there also, and that comes actually directly to our email. But we're not checking emails late at night. So if you have a problem, you you got to call the 800 number. Find it online. We're up, the, the number is everywhere. And uh, on the picture right now, it's on the side of the car in the picture. You can see the 800 number. Okay, next question. Are you seeing more OSHA activity and fines in 2014 as a result of California expenditure cutbacks at the state level? And is there any uh, correlation? That is a good question. I'm seeing more fines happening this year, yes, to answer the question. If you're wanting me to connect it to California being being hard up or they are not having as much money and so they're looking to 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 uh, to come at you in in these kind of a ways, that is a that is a question that uh, is is debatable. I can tell you this though. The citations are up. They're, they're bigger fines, and Cal OSHA is not bending as much. They've had a lot of internal changes in Cal OSHA, the, and, and the reality is from uh, their legal teams to their, the people that are running Cal OSHA, it, we, we, just, we just need to do the right thing. It is more important than ever to make sure your employees are safe, not because it's the right thing necessarily, but because it's good business sense. Employees that have safe work environments feel like their employers care. And employees who feel like they're cared about, I promise you, are more productive. Okay. Um, someone's asking when are, we're doing the webinars once a month right now. So um, you should get an email within the next few weeks letting you know towards the end of May will be our next webinar. Um, someone's asking here about being able to call our company in. Uh, between 8 to 5 with any questions. Oh yeah, anytime. You can call me 8 to 5. I don't bill by the minute, so you can just call me and say, hey, we just got a few questions for you. I have a team of about 16 people in my office doing a variety of things, and I and uh, I, I would love to be able to answer any question that you have. Uh, we're, we, we don't subcontract out our safety work. We don't. Our inspectors and trainers aren't subcontractors that we 1099. We, we, we are all in-house, and we're all here to do one thing. Make sure you're taken care of when it comes to your safety needs. Okay, here says, uh, I have Spanish-speaking employees, so would I let Cal OSHA know so that they can provide a translator? Well, if you have Spanish-speaking employees, I, I'm not sure you have to tell them to that detail before they come out. When they get out there, they might find it. That, that might limit their inspection or delay it to a certain extent, but that's not your fault. The reality is you don't know what questions they're going to want to ask, what they're going to need, and so 
you know, I, I would tell them answer the questions that they want. What happened? Where it was at? Who did? You know, what happened? And then the translation side, I've always seen Kalosha gets to work it out at some point. So I, I wouldn't go that far to be saying my people speak this, so be prepared to speak this language or, or, or this and that. I just let it be. Okay. Um, looks like our last question here it says corporate office is based in California but I'm in another state, not too sure what they're asking here. It says, do the same exact Cal OSHA laws apply? Well, if you're in another state, you got to know that every state has different rules and regulations. And so, no, if your head office is in California, but the accident takes place, let's say, in Arizona, then you've got Arizona laws that you're going to be able to deal with, the, the, the Arizona safety system out there which I believe is Fed OSHA. We are, we are a Cal OSHA specialist, but my team can look up any research. So if you want to call in on that and ask us, we can do some research and find out what you need to do over there, but you do need to report accidents to the federal system. They do have laws on that. We got one last question that we'll address here. Actually, a great question. Uh, does notifying your workers' comp insurance constitute notice to Cal OSHA? No. No, it doesn't. So for all those who are workers' compensation agents out there that are listening to me, let me just be very respectful. Cal OSHA is different than workers' comp. Safety is, is, is what's the word I'm trying to use? Safety is not everybody within helping employees be safe are experts in Cal OSHA law. A lot of the workers' comp agents that we know and talk to are not experts in Cal OSHA law. And if you ask them that directly, they'll admit it. They're great with what we call loss prevention and helping people with that. But a workers' comp agent is might not know all the ins and outs of the Cal OSHA system. So when you do call your workers' comp people first, and that's why I said after the employee stable, you call me first. Because your workers' comp guys usually are going to do one thing. They're going to pay out. What, what we need to decide is on a safety front, on a Cal OSHA front, what we're going to do. And so with all respect to the, Cal to the workers' comp, I think they'll agree with me. L let's deal with this issue first and then call them. Call them within 24 hours and deal with it. That'll be fine. But let's go through and really figure out if this is a reportable to Cal OSHA. Because a workers' comp saying they're going to do it for you, that, that won't constitute that and you'll still get the fine. Okay, well we're going to go ahead and wrap this up here. Actually, um, I will address the uh, question here about if you're not, an imp uh, if you're not a client of, of EEAP and you do have an incident, absolutely feel free to call us. Uh, we can help walk you through what, what you need to do and, and hopefully uh, gain your confidence and, and you will become an EEAP client. Um, as far as uh, can an employee refuse to be interviewed by Cal OSHA? Yes, employees can refuse to be interviewed. They can, they can refuse to be interviewed. There's nothing that Cal OSHA can do with that. Heck, an employee being asked to come to a, to a Cal OSHA hearing to testify can refuse. Uh, and so that is something that, that can be done if the employee just doesn't feel comfortable with it. That, that's fine. Okay, well, we're going to go ahead and wrap this up. As I said, you guys should all be getting an email here within a couple hours uh, of the replay. So if you have additional questions, you can enter them right there into the chat box. Those will come to our email. You feel free to call us. Happy to answer any questions for you. And uh, we appreciate your time for coming out, and, and we hope you're finding this to be helpful for you. Thanks a lot, and have a good day. Thanks, everybody. to do to help them move through that. And so that's going to be something that we offer you and you need to be able to keep aware of. I'm going to turn this over to Rick for a minute, just kind of explain this slide if that's okay. So here you go, Rick. Okay. So when it comes to where to report, you'll see on the right here we have a list with all the district offices in California and we're going to be providing a download of that for you as well. Um, and as Michael mentioned previously, you must report to the nearest district office. If you look at the bottom there, um, you'll notice that there's a link that goes to Cal OSHA's site. It'll be hyperlinked off of the download that we'll be giving you. And if you click on that link, it'll take you to Cal OSHA's site. And on the top left-hand side of their site, uh, you can click on that link, and it's a district office locator. All you have to do is uh, click, type in either your zip code or the name of your city, and uh, the district office that you need to report to will appear at that time. 
Um, so I would recommend that you print this and either circle or highlight the office that you would need to report to and make sure that the appropriate personnel have access to that. So whatever that means, posting it somewhere, making copies, whatever it takes. Um, so you'll notice also in this download uh, that there's some information there that'll tell you about things that you need to report and uh, that's some information that Michael's going to go over with you here as well. Uh, Rick is always really good at putting this stuff together and making sure the downloads are there for you so that you can you, you, you can have what you need. If you do need anything else from us, don't hesitate to call us and ask us. We are, we are here to be able to deliver the safety, is the safety uh, support that you need to make sure you can do your job. All right, what to report when they call. And this is a good thing to go over so that you just can get in your, in your mind, in the back of your mind, what you should be aware of at the time uh, that you actually takes place. Time and date, of course. Name, the employer's name. You want to be able to deliver that. Who the heck you're working for, of course. The name and job title of the person reporting. you got to be able to be prepared to ha know your title. So make sure that people who are assigned to this task, they know who they are. They know what, but uh, if you're looking at it and you're thinking, wow, that is really a nasty injury, it's probably going to be permanently disfigured. I know that's a crappy standard, but that is uh, probably a good way to be able to figure that out, and you can call us and go over that. The last one here is going to be quite long, and uh, I, I need you to hear the insanity of it to a certain degree and the vagueness of it. Impairment sufficient to cause a part of the body or the function of an organ to become permanently and significantly reduced in efficiency on or off the job, but not limited to, depending on the severity, second degree burn, second degree or worse burns, crushing injuries, including internal injuries, even though even though the skin surface may be intact, respiratory illnesses or broken bones. Now a lot of you like me are looking at this and thinking second degree burns. You got to be kidding me. And so the reality of it is you, you really got to make sure that when you have an accident that you have a method of determining quickly if this is going to be a Cal OSHA. And I can't say this uh, enough that once the employee in, an, in, the, in the event of an injury gets hurt, the, the best thing you can do for them is to, once the employee is stable, of course, and they, the ambulance has been called or they're doing okay, you give us a call and allow us just to walk you through what the next steps are. We, we will be able to ask you a number of questions that can help you figure out what steps you are. So if you're clients of mine, which the majority of you are, you just call us on our 1-800 number. It's at the bottom of every safety lesson we give you, the labor law posters you purchase from us, at the documentation we have, you can go on to eeap.com and our 800 number's there. I have my 24-hour consultation line, and after hours that does reach me, you leave a message, it beeps me and tells me there's a message, and I will call you back. But it's important that we have this conversation. Uh, because of some of the other information we're going to give you that we'll go over in a minute. All right. What is the timeline for reporting? That is going to be the, the, the best thing to be able to talk about when it comes to understanding how fast we... Hello, hello. Welcome. I'm Rick Roman here at EEAP, sitting alongside of Michael Crawley. Today we're going to be talking about reporting injuries and illness to Cal OSHA. Before we get started, though, for any of you that have not attended an EEAP webinar, if you notice at the top of the sidebar on your right, there are four tabs. Uh, they are labeled chat, polls, attendees, and pop-ins. If we take a poll or add a pop-in during the webinar, it'll appear automatically. And if you have questions afterwards, all you have to do is click on the chat tab, and you'll be taken back where you can type in your questions. Uh, so that takes care of that. So without further delay, we'll go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, Michael. Good afternoon. I hope everybody is doing okay. We're going to be talking about a conversation that always is uncomfortable by all the businesses out there on when to report, when not to report, and what they've got going on. So let me just start out with the overview here real quick. Uh, the differences between a recordable and a reportable incident is going to be one of the topics we cover. We're also going to talk about what defines a serious physical harm. 
the timeline for reporting, where and what to report, and the penalty for failing to report. Those are going to be the characteristics that we, uh, we're going to be going through. Let's start out with recordable versus reportable. Three levels of injury and illnesses. First one is going to be it only requires first aid and can be treated in-house. This is going to be like a doctor's, uh, like a first aid or something like that, a cut, a scrape that we can deal with a bandage or something like that. That's what that's going to be. The second one is going to be requires medical treatment and or time off of work or job reassignment. That's going to be a recordable. Now, when I say a recordable, I'm specifically saying to a CalHOSHA 300 log, I'm saying also to a, a, a workers' comp agency, and you can get more def definitions from your workers' comp agents on what is a recordable, but just for this webinar, we're trying to separate, have to re react. Every employer shall report immediately by telephone or telegraph, I, I can't imagine you got one of those, but in the case you do, to the nearest district office of the Division of Occupational Safety and Health, any serious injury or illness or death of an employee occurring in the place of employment or in connection with any employment. Now these bullet points that Rick has put together for us, these most of these are all Cal OSHA code right out of the code so you can see it. And so I find it important to read it to you so you can hear how they, they read it so you know that this isn't just Michael and Rick making up our own rules to this. This one always throws our clients into a little bit of a concern, how fast, what not. Immediately means as soon as particularly possible, but no longer than eight hours after the employer knows, and here's the catch, or with diligent inquiry would have known of the death or serious injury illness. So if you're saying to yourself, well, I didn't know, I truly didn't know the accident took place, and so I, I didn't need to call. It happened on a Friday afternoon. We had all gone home for the day, but I left a small crew at the job site or in the shop, and somebody got injured, and I didn't find out until about Monday. The, the reality is diligent inquiry means you, you, you would have been able to keep an eye on your employees. So if your employees are working, there always should be a chain of command to be able to communicate with you quickly about serious accidents or events that are taking place. And if you are out of the country or in a spot where you can't get cell phone coverage, where that communication can't be there, you must set up a second level, a second level to be able to respond to these things because I only have eight hours and then we're going to get a fine that's going to be large and it's going to be difficult for me to defend. And so the reality is to your management, you need to set up this and this is why the 24-hour consultation is there, that your management can call me and say, Michael, Cindy. Those are going to be the two main people you'll talk to here or even Lori McFate in my office. And you're going to say, ladies, Michael, what, what, what should I do? This is what's happened. I can't get a hold of this person. Help me walk me through the steps. And I can give them advice on what the difference is between what a Cal OSHA recordable is and a workers' comp recordable because there is two different things that you're going to find out. All right, the third one is going to be results in death or meets serious physical harm criteria, which is requires Kalosha to be notified. So the third one is the only category that is going to make it so you have to notify Kalosha. Now that third one that we're talking about, this right now what you're looking at is going to be the definition of it. And uh, what we've done is we've put a picture there that obviously is probably getting your attention a little bit, and that's going to play into a little bit of what we're talking about and how loose and somewhat vague this law is. So let me just read it word for word, and we'll go down through it. And uh, if you have any questions regarding this, feel free to type in questions even before the end of the webinar, and we will either address them now or when we get to the end. So let me start out here. Any inpatient hospitalization for the purpose other than observation uh, is required. So if they're in the hospital for uh, just because they're trying to uh, do observation and watch them for the next few weeks, that doesn't require Cal OSHA. But if they're in there overnight because they need surgery or something like that, that's what's going to trigger it on that. All right, the next bullet point. The loss of any member of the body. This is called the amputation rule that most of the district managers will talk about. This amputation is going to be uh, a finger, a knuckle, but it can be right down to the basics of this. 
it can be down to the basics of an ear with a tip with a little bit of cartilage. And so you've got to know that on that first doctor's report, if the doctor suggests that there is a partial amputation, then you've you got to make sure that you've got, uh, you've got that in place. The next bullet point is any serious degree of permanent disfigurement. Now this one, i got to tell you, is very vague. Um, I, uh, I always say that if you're looking at the employees uh, when they're injured or, or you're looking at the cuts and it leaves major, major scars or disfigurement of the bones or the fingers, this one is going to be vague, 